Hey, everybody. Welcome to Contra Talk. My name is Richard Henry, and I've got Pastor Ronnie Rogers here. Uh, he's from Oklahoma. Uh, he's a husband and a father um, and author, speaker. He's in the Southern Baptist Convention, and we're going to talk about some things that matter. So uh, welcome to the show, Ronnie Rogers. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much for having me, Richard. Yeah, why don't, you, why don't you tell us just a few just a few things about yourself. Uh, I've been married for 47 years and have two grown daughters, seven grandchildren, and two great sons-in-law. I was saved in 1978 at 25, surrendered to the ministry in 1980, and went to start pastoring in 1981. And uh, then I've been at my present church. I'm in my 24th year here at Trinity Baptist Church in Norman, Oklahoma. Wonderful. Wonderful. That's good. Um, are you, you went to, um, was it Midwest, uh, Mid-America, right, seminary? Criswell College. Criswell College, okay. And then I went to graduate school at Henderson University. Oh, okay. I must have misread that. Okay. Um, you're part of... The conservative Baptist network. Now I remember, and I'll just couch this because sometimes people, you know, stuff gets lost or whatever. I remember, so 2019, and we'll kind of unpack a lot of this, but 2019 was a whole, you know, resolution nine and critical theory. And it's just a tool da, 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 da. And then of course there wasn't a convention in 2020. Um, and then early 2021, you know, I remember hearing and even late 2020, the conservative Baptist network and this and that, and there was some elements and having several friends at, at seminary and guys who've graduated, you know, they're all quote unquote conservative, but there's definitely different streams yeah. <laughs> for lack of a better word. And I think sometimes, uh, you know, I want to be charitable, but I feel like some of the, some of the guys I, I spent time with and they're wonderful guys, but they don't see the subversive nature of a lot of the things that have gone on in evangelicalism in the PCA and the SBC um, and things like that. Yeah. And so they kind of think, ah, oh, yeah, you guys are just, we're all conservatives. And I remember reading an article from then president elect, I think he was Ed Litton uh, or not president, elect, a president, presidential candidate in earlier 2021 about, well, we're all, we're all conservatives. I don't understand why they exist. So for our audience, uh, Ronnie, why don't you tell us, why the CBN or the Conservative Baptist Network exists within and isn't a new denomination or anything, but just exists within the Southern Baptist Convention? Yeah, uh, uh, several, several of us, uh, about 20 from around the country, met uh, in uh, 2019 after the Resolution 9 had passed. And uh, many of us didn't know each other. I didn't know many of the people in the room. And but when we went around the room, we all had the same concerns. Mm. And basically, it could be summarized is there's a lot of great things and fruit from the conservative resurgence to be thankful for. And so there's a lot of good. However, there's some rotting fruit. Mm. And the way rotting fruit does, it destroys the good. fruit. And mm. so when we went around the room trying to get an, what everybody's opinion was, I mean, even though we didn't know each other, we were from different parts of the country, we were seeing exactly the same thing. And so out of that came, you know, would it be the will of the Lord maybe to try to save the convention from going down this road? And it definitely was going down mm -hmm. and still is to some degree. And then might he use us? And then the last question was, are we willing to pay the price because there is a price exacted? You're accused of all kinds of things and so forth. And those of us who lived through the resurgence have already had enough of that for three or four lifetimes. <laughs> and uh, and I had to pray very earnestly to do it, but I thought God wanted. So that 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 was what happened. And we that founding meeting, we started it. And then uh, it was launched publicly in February of 2020 on Valentine's Day and has grown uh, phenomenally since mm. then. And I believe it has had a great influence because what we were seeing was, though there was a lot of good things, these things, and if you want to, we can mention them and talk about them. But these things were just running uh, without resistance. Now, yeah. 
it didn't mean there weren't individuals resisting. We were, but I'm sitting in my study seeing it. I'm just shaking my head, not knowing what in the world's going on. And so there wasn't organized. And uh, the Founders Ministry has been very vocal. Tom Askell and them paid a great price speaking out on these things. Done. So I don't want to take anything. And Tom's right with us. And we're with Tom on this. But uh, there wasn't as many as needed to be. So when we formed it, there was a great backlash. But I would say at this time, we've seen results from the existence of resistance to going down the road of taking the SBC away from the good fruit of the resurgence. Okay. That's good. Uh, I like that. Yeah, definitely analogy with the fruit. It is yeah. amazing, like real rotten fruit. <laughs> How quickly, yeah. you know, the apples or the oranges, and you get the little blue spot, and you're like, what happened to this orange? And now they're all gross. Yeah. Uh, why don't you flesh out a little bit just to to dig back into history, uh, since you said you've lived through much of this. Yeah. Um, I know a lot of people are, are you know, different denominations that, that watch and will be watching this. Uh, and a lot of SBC or used to be SBC, but they don't know history. I, I'm, a, I'm a history guy. I think a lot, I yeah. think everybody should be to a degree. Yeah. Yeah. What happened and what is the difference um, between 40, 50 years ago, W.A. Criswell, Adrian Rogers, yeah. Paige Patterson, those guys, what were they fighting against? And, and obviously you, you were there to a degree yeah. and, and many others were there to a degree. Um, Tom Askell. But obviously, right. all were much younger, right? Uh, what were they fighting against, and how is it different, and how is it similar to what the SBC has been going through over the last 10 years? The similarity is always undermining the trustworthiness of the Scripture. It's always that. It just takes different shades. And back then, we, we go back to 1979 as the beginning, but, but it really... That's when the resurgence, that's when we elected Adrian Rogers and saw mm -hmm. that something might could happen, though it was still very iffy. But you have to go back earlier in that. And I think we're paralleling now, not, not the 70s and 80s, not 79 and 80s, but I think we're parallel, paralleling the 60s. Mm. Because it was in the early 60s that uh, Roy Honeycutt wrote a book. And in that, he denied the inerrancy of scripture, the truthfulness, and Ralph Elliott at Midwestern did exactly the same thing. And so we finally had them in writing. Wow. In other words, you can know a lot of these things, but you've got to get it in writing. And so it began there, and then uh, some would date it back to the starting of Mid-America Seminary and Criswell College, because you got to have people who understand the issues to fight it. And But it started culminating uh, as a... a Approach in 1979. So what we were fighting was there was some classic liberalism, you know, which just denies everything. Mm -hmm. But it was it was to a large degree it was what's called neo orthodoxy, and as you well know, but that is that they basically are using terms of orthodoxy, but they don't mean exactly uh, the same thing. And and uh, for, out of a man named Karl Bart who went liberal. Then when he saw the, the Holocaust, he went back to his church. He, he was trying to preach to them as a pastor, and he had nothing to say from mm. classic liberalism. So he began the move back, never made it back. And in some ways, it's more lethal because it's more difficult to uh, detect. Mm. So we had, like at Midwestern, where I served as a trustee from 1991 to 1998, when Dr. Ferguson was there, there were no inerrantists wow. on the faculty, none. And we were well into the resurgence by then. Mm. And they would have uh, homosexuals come to the classroom and talk about their gift from God. Uh, they were teaching that uh, God was a woman. And in one video, she was a very, he was a very, the woman was very seductive, laid out on a couch and so forth and so on. So wow. it was just. And this was in the 90s? This is in this the 90s. In the 90s, yes. Wow. This was in the 90s. Wow, we, we think it's passed, bad today, right? Yeah, we passed, and there was no pro-life. We passed a resolution when we got a majority on the board. We passed resolution pro-life at Mid Midwestern Seminary. Now, in the convention, we'd been passed them since 1979. Mm. 
mm-hmm. or 80. But we, we passed one maybe in 92 or 93 or 94. And when we tried to pass it, uh, two or three of us, I was one of them, was called to a meeting with the president and the vice president, some faculty and the seminary lawyers. And they threatened to sue us if we brought that resolution to a vote the next day. So we wow. met for several hours late one night and we did bring it and it passed. They didn't all become pro, pro-life, but they stopped talking about pro-abortion in the, in the classes. So it was that, it was women preachers. The, the two, I think the two preachers of the year before uh, I went there were women. Mm. So it was very egalitarian and very acceptable of various uh, moral lifestyles. And so it was it was a host of things, but the most deep seated was the denial of the inerrancy of scripture. And, I, and when I use inerrancy, I'm speaking of the Chicago statement, mm-hmm. which basically is that the Bible from Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 22 21 contains no errors in the autographs. That that is penned by God, the original manuscript, there are no errors. That's all. And you can get into all the other stuff, but that's what it is. And they they denied that. And in that, you are ultimately also denying the sufficiency of Scripture. Mm. That was the main thing uh, that was going on that we were fighting. It was very clear. And they were in all of our seminaries. I mean, it, it was just overwhelming. It was worse than it is now by far. Yeah. Well, I mean, in one sense, that's an encouragement. Um yeah. When did things start to, I mean, I think a lot of stuff, people, good, bad, or otherwise, depending on how you look at eschatology and everything else, you know, how much secular and sacred, one kingdom, two kingdom, and, you know, hiding from the culture or taking the culture for Christ. And I know Baptists kind of differ a little bit on those, and there's different denominations, but a lot of the stuff we saw, you know, post-Civil War, into the World War One, World War Two, and so on. When did a lot of this start, though, within the denomination? I mean, was it the 40s? Was it the 30s, the 50s? When did these things start to really do a leftward turn? Well, by by these early 60s, as I said, the writings came out. And by the time that's made public, it's been going on Mm -hmm. for a while. So it's kind of like if you take Resolution 9, when that passed, that was a signal not that we're going in the wrong direction and there's trouble ahead. We are in trouble. Mm-hmm. And this is a manifestation of it. That was a call to arms. And, and so, I, you know, back in the, I mean, it just starts very, very, very incrementally, very slowly of accepting this little thing. And then this little thing. And if you bring it up, we're all conservatives. Hey, that's, it's not a big deal in the scheme of things, but it's an erosion. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm, uh, the the Baptist faith and message was written in 1925, that particular one, mm-hmm. and so we it was written again in 1963 or something. You know, we, about every 40 years, and and that's kind of a uh, an idea that every 40 years you have to kind of update it because some things are uh, seeping through mm-hmm. the cracks. So it you know it could have been little by little in the 40s and 50s. And uh, but by the 60s, we can say that with Elliot and Honeycutt, them publishing that, you now had a call to arms. You could show the person in the pew. This is what your seminary president and professors are saying. Mm. And uh, and that and you've got to have the people in the pew or you can't you cannot do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that at least from my understanding and obviously that what you said that that fleshes out even more for me, but that so many people in the churches by and large still don't want whatever newfangled thing, whether it's in 2020 or 2018 or 1963 or 1943, you know, most of this stuff, it's like, I just want to preach the Bible. I mean, I've, I've preached, you know, in a handful of other churches besides the one I pastor and mostly small rural churches here in Kentucky and and Indiana. And they just want the Bible. I just want to hear. Now, obviously that, you know, that can differ a little bit, but they don't really want to have all this other things. And I'm sorry, wait, all of a sudden now the Bible is not trustworthy. I'm sorry. You don't, Jesus isn't born of a virgin, you know, and all these things that 
you know, you learn as a child mm -hmm. and you like, well, of course I'm going to trust this because why not? It's not just for children, it's for everybody. But then you, you grow up and then you realize, oh, these people don't actually believe that. And it's like, ah, uh, no, 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 I just, just give me the Bible. I don't want your weird ideal ideology. Just give me the Bible. And I think that's happening in a sense with even, um, the intersectional critical theory, all this wokeism for, you know, for shorthand of, yeah, you guys don't really have the gospel. I know we thought we did, but lo and behold, we don't, which to me sounds like another gospel. That kind of sounds like Galatians and that kind of sounds like doubly damnable stuff. <laughs> like That's right. So yeah. it's, yeah. Well, um, when we tried to present this to the churches back then, my friend, his church called him a liar. Oh, dear. Now, they loved him, but they couldn't believe in the Southern Baptist seminaries they were teaching these things. And I went to a church that the pastor had said it was all a, a, a pastor's fight. There wasn't anything to it. Mm. And so I couldn't even talk about it. But I started taking five minutes on a Wednesday night before I do Bible study, and I would read them some quotes. And by the end of the year, we sent a full slate of messengers to the convention. And one of the things that really got them, there was a graduate student at Southern. And his thesis was okay by the, you know, two or three professors, which it has to be. And it basically showed that they come into Southern Seminary conservative and they leave more liberal. Mm. Body, and so it had the percentages and everything. And it became public knowledge. And so I'm talking about a large percentage of those graduating going into the mission field and pastoring didn't believe in God when they left. They didn't believe in the virgin birth. They didn't believe in the resurrection. So this student played a huge role. I mean, wow. this is, again, it's not just uh, pastors or theologians. It's students. Students played a huge role at Midwestern. And it's people in the pew. Mm hmm or you can't do it, and we won't be able to do it this time if we don't have that. Yeah. So there. So it doesn't sound as heinous, right? As far as cut and dry, um, as far as hey, I'm, I I don't believe in God, or I don't believe yeah. in the virgin birth, that sort of thing. Like, well, that's pretty easy. <laughs> like, that's wrong. This is right. Let's go with this. But I said it, and then you you just said it with hey, we're all conservatives. It's not a big deal. It's almost the kind of gaslighting sort of like, you're crazy. This yeah. is not what's really happening. What is then happening? Because I know Resolution Now is kind of a flashpoint. Okay. But what are the things that, again, you're far, you're far more uh, intelligent than me and know these things far better than I do. Uh, for our audience, again, what are the things that you've seen and these kind of – these pinpoint stuff that had built to Resolution 9 and built to now where we are today. Okay, well, let me just mention the Resolution 9 so I don't forget, and then I'll talk about some other things, because there are other things, but that that was clearly a watershed event. There's no doubt about it, and it remains that watershed event, mm -hmm. and, and even the way people are responding by fighting us and trying to overturn it or to repudiate it, it is absolutely amazing. And so I've, I, have, I have spent a lot of time and read the original writings of the most uh, prominent neo-Marxist of the 20th and 21st century influence. I've read the founding documents. There's about 28 essays written that formed the critical race theory movement, most of it by legal uh, scholars, critical legal scholars. I've read... Uh, Derek Bell, who's supposed to be the father. I've read his writings. I've read uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. So my point is I've spent an enormous amount of time reading the original writings of the Marxist and the critical race theory people. Mm -hmm. And I've written one book, but it was designed to wake up the average person to know this is affecting you. This next one will probably be more at an intermediate level. But the connection between Marxism and uh, critical race theory is undeniable. It is explicit throughout their writings. It is implicit in their ideologies. It is, you never, you can read thousands and thousands and thousands of pages and never see capitalism spoken of as a good thing and never see socialism and Marxism spoken of as a bad thing. Plus, naming them, 
I mean, by name, relying on the Frankfurt School and on and on. So this is beyond question, yet we have people in our leaders in our convention acting like we're overstating the case. Mm -hmm. I can't overstate it. I just, it's impossible to overstate. So the CRT, the basic thing about it is, it is acidic and corrosive, and it does not coexist with anything else. Mm -hmm. And that's what's going on in the convention in a very small way. But since the CBN has, and I have documentation in this, in the, con in the convention, but since the CBN has come out and we've exposed some of this stuff, they are still doing it, just not as vocally. But I mm. have the documentation. But I'll have a pastor tell me that, you know, we're making this up. So I'll send them this thing. And I never hear from them again. So that's, that is the biggest issue. Because if you lose to this, you lose Christianity being open and free. You lose the SBC. You lose America. You lose everything. And it's a very advanced, very sophisticated and very pervasive mm. throughout our society and evangelicalism. So that's one thing. Uh, some other things were uh, the women preachers, the egalitarianism. I mean, we fought this in the resurgence that the pastor and so forth was reserved for men, nothing against women, nothing for men. It's just God's design. And mm. we can parallel that in other places, but uh, Molly Marshall green. So we fought that. Well, now we, they've taken us back down that road again. And so we push back on that. The we've been what's going on now is harder to detect. And I use the words too accommodating. And what I mean mm. by that is um, so Dr. Al Moeller, who I've known for over a quarter of a century. And I remember when he was strong and clear as he could be. Well, he's still strong on a lot of things, but it's not as clear because he'll denounce CRT with everything. And he does mm. a good job, by the way. And however, you can't get him to speak out. He didn't speak out. He was in the convention when Resolution 9 was passed, and he wouldn't speak out against it. And he was asked to do that by Tom Askell. Mm -hmm. Tom said, are you going to speak out? And he said, well, I don't know. And he didn't. And he left Tom and a couple of others there to try to do something. And then the next day, Al speaks out. When the CBN was organized, he came out with a uh, kind of a dig towards us. But then when a woman preacher is up or something, we don't hear anything from him. Uh, he, homosexuality. He gave in on the orientation. Mm. And so I wrote an article on it because he wrote, he did it and he got such uh, uh, feedback that he wrote then a 1600 word article trying to explain why he changed two or three words. And my, my contention there is, if you if you say something and it takes 1600 words to explain what you said in that sentence, something's wrong. But the homosexual community knew exactly what he was doing when mm -hmm. he he bought in to orientation. Russell Moore, he denounced uh, reparative therapy. We're talking about homosexuals leaving homosexuality. Mm -hmm. and, but one of the things Russell has been notorious for, and he did it in this. And I've written articles on my blog about all this and document the, the sources and stuff. But uh, Russell, he, he denounced it as being cruel, all these things. And he never interacted with the leading people in the country in it. He never interacted with the developer of it. He never interacted with secular organizations who had tremendous success. Mm. He acted like, the, so he, he, it's a straw man thing. He mischaracterized it. Beth Moore went back and took a chapter or a large part of a chapter out of a book she had written where she called homosexuality sin. She removed it. Wow. And J.D. Greer, he's gone into homosexuality. You know, it's this whispering. God whispers about these sins and he yells about these others. Well, I've written an article dealing with him on that. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, pronoun hospitality. And you can take you can take they, whatever pronoun they want to use. And the problem with that is, besides it being wrong, the problem, one problem from an evangelistic, there's four times in the New Testament that God uses his self as a creator, the creation to evangelize mm -hmm. four times. So he's wiping that off the map. So uh, that's another thing. Um, then you have people like uh, Al Mohler having Matthew Hall. Jarvis Williams, 
Curtis Woods, who used to be a professor there. And I and I show how Al Mohler speaks in the same language of critical race theory. Now, mm. again, he denounces it. But he also speaks consistent with it. And it's the weirdest thing. And I document where he does that. And I don't know if you know, but he didn't sign the uh, statement on social justice with John MacArthur and Tom Askell and Bodie Bauckham and, and yeah. others. And and when he gave his answer why he didn't, it was because he didn't have a part in originating it. He doesn't like to sign those. Well, I actually did the research and found that that's not the reason. And he actually eventually preached a message in chapel where he said why, and he disagrees with some things. Mm -hmm. So what you find is, and it's real hard, I'll talk to somebody and they'll say, well, no, I heard him denounce it. I say, I know, but he does this and this and this. J.D. Greer, homosexuality is sin. But then he says these other things. Beth Moore, it's in, but she takes it out. Russell Moore. And then there is just going down the liberal <clears throat> path. And one of the things that's very subtle is the abortion issue. And and Russell Moore on the, I think it was the 2020 March for Life, which was begun in protest to the 1973 Roe v. Wade decision. There's no doubt about it. Pro-life mm -hmm. meant against abortion. Now, I'm not saying you can't include other things, but that's what it is historically. Well, he started mixing it and he wrote an article or published, republished an article uh, the night before this march. And they bring in uh, um, border issues, affirmative action. So what happens is this thing where they're murdering babies every day gets thrown in this other, meaning if you're not for affirmative action or you're not agree with, with them on border issues, I mean, we're all for humane uh, treatment, but then you're not pro-life, see? So they're changing. Right. And Dwight McKissick, uh, who's a black pastor in our uh, convention, who's quite moderate, and I mean, he, he even said that Biden was more pro-life than Trump. And, and and so I quote Biden supporting I mean, it's, you, uh, you all know what he does. So so you see how they're con what they're doing is they're taking these issues and they're saying this is wrong. But then they're doing it. They're hiring professors. You have Walter Strickland at Southeastern. And I know Danny. Danny and I both are graduates of Criswell. And you have Walter Strickland who's speaking positively about black liberation theology from James Cone. Mm. Then Danny Aiken comes out and rightly says that's heresy because it comes from Marxism and out of Brazil and the Catholic church. But you see, you see what I'm saying? One minute this is one minute this and Danny Aiken, there was a, 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 a black woman scholar from Africa who spoke at Southeastern. And so some, some people, had problems with it and said it on uh, Twitter. Not not her being black or woman, but what she was doing. She was mm -hmm. using standpoint epistemology and so forth. And so Danny came out and castigated people and said, if you're not going to listen to the whole thing of a scholar, you shouldn't comment. Well, I did listen to it. And I commented and it was worse than I thought. <laughs> And she, wow. she, you know, you know, the, the historical grammatical method, which we study the scripture, they still use that and they say it, no doubt about it. But when she put it in order, instead of saying it first, she had application first. And that last. Oh, yeah. And we use the historical. I mean, it's kind of like this addendum. Well, it wasn't that way when I was in school. Mm. And then um, they overlay it. So there are professors teaching that you overlay the historical grammatical method with your experience, with your lived experience. And the lived experience in CRT, you don't have objective truth. Mm -hmm. And so it, uh, lived experience, and it depends on how many times and ways you've been oppressed, how authoritative it is. So uh, that's going on. Um, I mean, you think about Beth Moore left and went to Episcopalian church. Russell Moore went to one where it's pedo baptism. So, so these are a lot of the issues. One of them, too, is, and so my church has at least 10 races or ethnicities, because I believe there's a human race with God, but we use yeah. that term. Yeah. But there's 10 races or 10 ethnicities at any time. I mean, it's the most mixed up thing you've ever seen, and we're thankful for it.
Amen. You can't be a racist, true racist, and be here. But yet, according to CRT, I am, my associate pastor is, who has four black children, and my music minister, who has 12 children, children, and 10 of them are, I think, from four or five countries. Wow. And I mean, but we're still uh, racist. So it's, it's when I say that, I'm, I'm trying to say that, that you can't be a racist and be here. And we would minister to anybody, but we are going to uh, stand for the truth. And so we practice church discipline since mm. I've been here 23 years. We've had uh, 12 or 13 cases involving everything you can imagine. If there's sexual abuse, and there has been, we dealt with it as a church. We we got the courts involved, and that man's in prison right now and cannot be paroled. He'll mm. be about 90 before he would finish his term. So, And we ministered to the families who were hurt. It didn't happen at our church. It happened outside. But the person who did it was in our church. Mm. And so we ministered to the families who were hurt by it, even up to a year helping them support their children. So we've been, we do that. The Me Too movement, in my estimation, has done some really good, but it's doing a lot of harm. And here's the harm. We're changing what it means to be guilty. Mm. If we can get enough accusations against a man, he's guilty. We don't have to go any further. And we're ruining people's lives and careers and, you know, once it gets going on the Internet, you just can't interact on any yeah. substance. Thing. So I think that's a problem. And I preached a series in the beginning of 2020 called In Defense of God's Order and the Gospel. And I dealt with women preaching. Beth Moore, I mean, it's not just that she's a woman uh, going and promoting pastoring and things like that. What she does in the interpretation of Scripture is nothing more than, than mystical. I mean, she's just a mystic. And um, that's uh, uh, that's something, I, just to interrupt you for a moment, yeah, no, I've seen that a lot. Uh, I was having, because I have a lot of inter interaction with uh, my content. Uh, I've got a pretty good mix of ages and even male and female. Uh, one gal brought up uh, Priscilla Schreier. And I thought, is that Tony Evans' daughter? Yeah, it is. And she mentioned, she saw something about, uh, Priscilla was talking about, hearing a fresh word from God and this and this, which is super charismatic -y, which, okay, we can have differences with charismatics and this and that, but like all that's doing is saying, where's my Bible? This, this isn't enough. This isn't enough, right? So whether it's the woke ideology of, well, your lived experience or the, the, you know, a hundred years ago, the liberals, and now it's progressive Christians and well, that's good, but you need to do this or yeah. you need to add with the, the critical theory and you're that and you're adding your and working toward and all these. And it's like that this is, this is enough. We don't need to speak in tongues right. and have a fresh word from God. That's but right. so many people want that. And honestly, I mean, there's a, quite a few very orthodox, solid ladies out there on YouTube, especially Doreen Virtue is one. And I've heard of a, a few others. And she just, they castigate these ladies, the Beth Moores and things like that, oh, yeah. that they do that because it isn't even good teaching. <laughs> no, even like, okay, you're pastoring, you're preaching when you're, you know, going against, you know, Corinthians and Timothy and right. so on. But you're now you're basically preaching some sort of gnosticism. Yeah. That's like, no, that's not yeah. good either. No, you're that's going. right. And and they are doing that. And so that's been a problem. And you mentioned you hit the nail on the head though, the CBN, if you'll notice the sufficiency of scripture. And we have people saying they believe in inerrancy, so I, I, I let that go. I mm -hmm. think they're inconsistent with it, but, but they are really inconsistent with the sufficiency of Scripture for just the reasons you mentioned. Yeah, it's 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 shocking. The one, the, well, I've got a couple more questions, but um, when you said, again, the lived experience. So, hey, this Bible, yeah, it's hermeneutical, grammatical, yeah, but also your lived experience. Is that not, because I remember hearing stories, right? I went to Southern. I mean, it was the yeah. flagship. That's where Roy Honeycutt was president before. That's where Mueller right. is now. You know, it's a, it was the the I don't know, incubator. I don't know what yeah. the best word is. But, you know, Molly Marshall was there before Mueller oh, came yeah. and so on. And so, I mean, you know all this. But I remember him, Mueller having a conversation. He told the story. I heard him 
tell it a few times that a professor came and was like, how do we know what the author says? How can we know authorial intent? Da, 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 da. And Mueller's like, and no, I might butcher it, but basically, well, what if I fired you right now? And he's like, I, oh, I'd sue you. I have a contract. And he's like, yeah. how do we know what that word means? How do we know what the author really meant with that contract? And of course, I don't know what the response was, whether he just walked away. But if we don't know authorial intent with the the literature, the words that are being used by the author to the audience and what's going on, it's irrelevant who's reading it. And it doesn't matter. If I write I love you to my wife and an email at the end and some other things about our children and how we used to live here and now we're looking to the future, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I get to decide. And anybody with a brain knows that when they write a text or an email or a letter or a book or whatever, they're the one. But somehow we look at scripture and we're like, yeah, but they're all dead. And sure, it's God's word. But, you know, my, I'm better than God. Like, that's, that's right. all they're saying. And it's it's just astounding. It's astounding. Yeah, it's, it's quite arrogant. And that's, you know, that I, I'm not uh, uh, real strong on knowledge of uh, postmodernism, particularly in the literature and arts where it was beginning. But some things are left over from that who have coupled with uh, Marxism, and Derrida was a Marxist, and, and uh, from Foucault and Derrida and others, but that is uh, knowledge, language, and power. And those are the words that come up all the time. And so they don't, they, in postmodernism, there's no, it wasn't the authorial intent, it was the reader's thought that mattered what the text said. And so now you find in CRT, you know, there's no absolutes or you'll hear one of them. I think it was Crenshaw one day who said the only absolute is that we all know that oppression is wrong. Mm -hmm. And but but your lived experience. Carries the weight of even if we say there's objective evidence, you know, to the contrary. So the historical grammatical method, I tell people, I say what that's supposed to do. If I'm sitting with a black person, an Asian person, a man, a woman, we're all different ages, we lived in different countries, and we're going to study the Bible, what that does is makes where we're from and who we are irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about an interpretation. It matters the context, the grammar, the history, the culture. Then, then we find out what God meant by what he said, authorial intent. And how did the recipients understand it in that context? That is how you arrive at interpretation. And it doesn't matter for a man or a woman or anything. Then, you know, when you apply it, there can be a lot of application. Well, they make their lived experience necessary mm -hmm. to understand the interpretation. And that's where we are now. And that's yes. in our schools, by the way. Yeah. And it's and it's so funny because, I mean, even, you know, these, these same guys, um, you know, and there's other more popular pastors that have kind of strayed a lot. You know, they were solid 10, 5, 10 years oh, ago, 20 years ago. And you think, now I have a whole, we could probably talk about it for an hour, another hour on, on my theories on some of those guys. But um, it's the same stuff that they will castigate Roman Catholics for and say, you can't trust the Pope. You can't, who cares about the, the Council of Trent? Who cares about Orange? Who cares about this? That's no, 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 no. You can't talk about the catechism. Yeah. Sure, that's helpful, but that's not scripture. You know, these are the same people that would say that to a, a Roman Catholic, a faithful Roman Catholic that might, you know, say, yeah, racism is wrong, but that's not racism and right. completely disagree with all the critical theory stuff. But they're also lifting up the Pope and all these other councils and things. And yet the Southern Baptist is doing the same thing, but with just a different catechism and a different Pope and a different, it's just like, guys, yeah. you're doing the same thing. Like it's, it's yeah. un, unbelievable. Um, what, so again, kind of come and start circling for a landing. What, cause some people I've already heard and, you know, snarky comments online. Cause sometimes I'll say in my videos, Hey, I'm a Southern Baptist pastor. No, we're not woke. Don't worry. You know, kind of tongue in cheek and stuff. And I, Oh, you, you lost me at Southern Baptist. All the good Southern Baptists is left all, you know, the denomination sinking. Oh, it's terrible. And, you know, keyboard warriors and okay, fine. You got your opinion, but like, say we all just, we, you and me, our churches, Tom Askell's church, ever, forget it. We're done. We're done. And we all pull out. It's twofold. So say we all pull out. 
what happens? What happens? Well, uh, that that was posed to me, and I have I recently posed it to a group of men, same thing, but it was posed to me. I didn't plagiarize. I gave credit for where I heard it. But uh, Dr. Richard Land, back in the early part of the research, it's about 1982 or three, he was a systematic professor of mine at Criswell. And I, I didn't grow, not grow up Baptist. I really didn't have any allegiances, you know, and, and I just thought this is a mess and I don't know if they're ever going to pull it out, but I can't believe we have people who are paying and doing this. So I was thinking about going into a Bible church. Yeah. And one day he spoke on this. And so I'm going to use general numbers that he used and paraphrase. But, you know, he said, he said, so let's just say there's 15 million people who identify as Southern Baptists. He said, maybe there's a hundred thousand that know what's going on. Mm. Wow. And he said, if you who know leave, not only do you lose a couple of billion dollars worth of property that people have bought by giving and organizationally, but you leave all these people to be taken down the lane and their children into apostasy, into liberalism, just like the other denominations. And God convicted me and I wasn't going to leave no matter what. Well, I mm -hmm. think that's where we are. And I have some dear friends. If it wasn't for the CBN, I can tell you because we all get calls and I'm involved with a number of people and everybody else is too that they want to leave and they're hanging on because of the CBN. And I remember when we were starting it, I couldn't tell people what was coming. I just said, please trust me. Don't leave yet. Please don't leave. And so that's the idea. If we leave, if all of us leave who know what's going on, they will take over, do what they want to do. It'll continue its descendancy. And you will lose everything to another liberal denomination that's going to be so dishonoring to God, mislead people, just like we see in Methodism and Episcopalian. And generally, there's always conservatives in some of those areas in those pockets. And we train uh, from 33 to 40 percent of all people who go to seminary in the United States go through one of our seminaries. Mm. So if you let yeah. them go by the wayside, you understand you're affecting everything. And another thing we don't think about is, and I, I know people who go to other countries, you know, on missions and stuff. And they've told me, they said, you know, when we're over there, there's a Baptist church and they're not Southern Baptist. But when we change our statement of faith to make it stronger on something, they change theirs. Mm -hmm. They're watching us. I remember Robert Lewis, who was a pastor of Fellowship Bible Church in Little Rock, large church, not connected with the SBC at all. And I remember in the resurgence, he told his church one morning, he said, we all need to be praying about this because he said, we're not Southern Baptists. But what happens in that convention, because it's so big, it has ripple effects throughout evangelical Christianity around the globe. Mm. And he's right. So. We can't leave these people who don't know what's going on. They don't, they don't get it. And, uh, and I'm convinced that a lot of people that are thinking CRT is not that bad. Some of them, some of them, they either know the Marxian dependency and foundation and structure and they like it or they don't. And they're just really naive for whatever reason, but you leave them to, be swallowed up and just think about their children. So if you didn't understand this stuff and you grew up, you reared, reared your children, you leave, you die, but your children and your grandchildren, because mm -hmm. you were a Southern Baptist, but it's not the same convention. Mm -hmm. Wow. So that's, that, that's one of my last questions then. Yeah. What, what's the point? I'm, I'm in the PCA. I'm non-denom. I'm a Calvary Chapel. I'm a whatever. Well, you just said 35 to 40 percent of yeah. pastors are all trained and missionaries and, you know, women's Bible studies, authors, speakers, podcasters uh, who go to seminary are going to be at one of the six Southern Baptist schools and then internationally uh, as well. That's that's huge. That's I think a lot of people just don't they just don't think about that. Like, well, I'm not Southern Baptist. See ya. You know, and I right. get it. You know, Josh Boyce left with, you know, Praise Mill and, and, and yeah. I get other churches have left. I understand that. And then a lot of the I would call them liberals. Russell Moore, Beth Moore, 
uh, than some of the other guys. Wish wish Dwight McKissick would leave, but you know, whatever. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know why he hasn't. To Trump be honest, can. yeah, I know. Well, he threatens know. to if we overturn I... Resolution Nine. Well, let's hope we will. Yeah. Um, last, lastly, just wrapping up. What can I do? What can the average my colleagues on online? Some of I've got a lot of friends who do channels as well. Uh, even people who might be in college and they're thinking, oh, I want to go into the ministry, or just the average church, you know, rural city, yeah. whatever church, church going SBC or otherwise. What what can we do uh, to fight, as it yeah. were? Well, I mean, uh, if I can mention the pastors just for a second, they they have to become courageous mm. and they have to lay out the facts. And if you lay out the facts to the people of God, they'll get it. You don't have to browbeat them. You don't have to force it. Just like I said, what I did in my last church. And here I just told them when the CBM started, let me give you some things are going on. And like you said, they don't want it. So they're mm -hmm. ready. And so that's that they have to do it. But. You have to have the people in the pew so they they can listen to podcasts like yours and they can. There are some uh, books that have been written that are helpful and they can get a handle on it or articles that they can get a handle on what's going on and kind of it fires you up when you see it. But the ultimate thing is. We have to go to the conventions and elect a president, the Southern Baptist Convention is a bottom up organization where you know Episcopalian Presbyterian they're top down so the people in the pew from the small church go to the convention and their vote counts as much as the pastor in the biggest church in the convention and we are a convention of small churches by the way mm -hmm. you know we know that and so they have to get a little bit of understanding and then go to the conventions and I remember people taking vacations. They they made that wherever they were going for convention, their vacation. They saved money. I mean, just so many sacrifices of, of the average person. And I can tell you that the resurgence and every leader that I've ever talked to would say the same thing. Could not have happened, been impossible without the lay people in the pew. And then uh, the same is true today. And I'll tell you another thing. Preachers. Well, they're not going to get called to a bigger church if they say that. If somebody's going to get mad at them. They're going to get accused of something. The lay person doesn't care. Once you get it in them, yeah, they'll storm the gates. And yeah. so we have to go. And, and so the CBN existed. We had our first election this summer and four candidates. And ours came in second. We lost, if we would have got 300 more votes, 314, I think, we would have won. Yeah. That, well, that, he came in first to begin with, technically. Yeah. yeah. He got more votes than, he had more did, than anybody. But it was, it was, you, right. had to, you need 51 or 50 right. plus you get percent. There. Yeah. So, but for us to get that close mm -hmm. in the first year, I mean, it's unheard of. Because remember, in the convention, yes, we won with Adrian, but there'd been many years of defeat. That was the first victory. Wow. And that was, like I said, these books came out in the early 60s. So you're talking about a long, hard fight and building two schools and so forth. Mm -hmm. But so we've done well and we have won Anaheim, you know, in California. And people say, well, I don't know if we can do anything conservative there. So we've won. With There's conservatives. I'm from California. There's That's plenty right. of conservatives in California. Yeah. Trust and me. a lot of times when these conventions are off like that, we do win. Mm -hmm. We did in the resurgence. So that's that's it. You have to become informed um, and you have to go to the convention. We have to have the votes to win. And if you don't win that, there's nothing you can do because that president starts the the he appoints the committee on committees without getting into all the weeds. And then there's a committee on nomination. But ultimately, that's what chooses your people who sit on your boards mm -hmm. and they make the decisions who to hire. Yeah. And we have to change that. Is there so? This is the last question. I got to go get my daughter here in a moment uh, sure. from school. But is I know he's our favorite guy, or at least my favorite guy, Doctor Doctor Ed. Um, no, I try not to be. Yeah, I don't want to be me. Uh, anyway, usually there's a second term, right? That's given as a courtesy. Is that going to yeah. happen in 2022, 
or is there somebody, is a guy going to run? Are we going to have a contender that's going to go up against Litton and, and, and take him down or, or what's the plan? I don't know of one yet that is being discussed. And the reason it's being discussed is because what Ed Litton has done and the plagiarism going back to 2015 and I, I've listened, I just about a month ago, listened to them again. Mm. I can't even believe it. And and he's he showcased at Southwestern uh, and talking to the president. And it's kind of like it's nothing. When I was in school, I just can't even tell you. You wouldn't even consider it. So that's a really serious thing that we have a president who has a known plagiarizing and it doesn't matter if someone gave you permission. If you act like that story happened with you and your wife and it happened with them, that's fraud in front of your church. And, and let me just say one other thing on that. Yes, it's illegal. Yes, it's unethical. Yes, we shouldn't do it. But my number one complaint against it is this. And this tells me about the man. We as preachers are not just about getting in our study and our time with God to produce a sermon. That's number one. We're trying to know God and prayerfully out of that will come messages. But the second thing is that when he does that, he, he minimizes or negates the priority of sitting in the presence of God for hours upon end each day to know God. That's what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have leading us. So there is talk about running somebody. It is customary to not do that. And right now, I don't know a sure word on that. Mm. Okay. But there'll be well, other things that will come up at Anaheim, see, uh, on, to vote on, like there were this time. But some of them they didn't let to the floor. Yeah. Yeah, I heard stories. I was in Nashville. That was my first convention. Yeah, and we and now know pretty strange. That, that Barry McCarty, who's the chief parliamentarian, and he was the one that really helped us through the resurgence. And we now know that J.D. Greer, what Tom Askell was trying to bring and get discussed, the lawyer who came to the podium and said, you know, you can't do that. But actually, Barry McCarty had said, no, it is in order. Mm. And even J.D. Greer's own chosen parliamentarian said, no. He's in order, and he went and found somebody who said it wasn't, and that's how that happened. Yeah. Uh, we need to be there. Yeah. Amen. Well, I appreciate the time. Um, thank you so much for this, and, and uh, I definitely love to love to talk again more. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thank you again, and very encouraging. And we'll, uh, I'll, I'll get your the books. I you got a website, so I'll put that in the description for everybody and your books and everything as well and your church and all that. So thank you for your work and again, um, very good conversation. So uh, thank you right. very much, Richard. Thanks, I really Ronnie. enjoyed it. Thank you yeah. very much. Me Bye. too. I wish you guys the best.